The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. For a long time, when somebody passes, in one respect, we see that person as just leaving, they're gone. That's not the truth. The truth is, they finished their race. I'm saying this because many more people are going to lose others close to them. They will have finished their race also. They will have completed their tasks. And you know what brings up a real opportunity for strength, trusting in the Lord, and going forward, not being hindered by topics and subjects, afraid to face certain things. And it really gives a type of closure, a truthful closure. Instead of a person going around really thinking that somehow that individual, they'll never see him again, they'll never encounter them again. No, that's not the truth. And when you put those things in perspective, like the flesh and the spirit, because, for example, if a person is on the face of this earth and they're trying their best to get things right and they keep slipping up, so on and so forth, well, that's why Jesus came in the first place. The intent of the heart is the truth of the person. The truth of an individual is not the habit they have. It's not the slip-ups. It's the intent of the heart. And when a person is going through this life, so many times they get judged by their slips and mishaps and whatever it is. What we don't understand is when a person passes that believes in the Lord, they're freed of the flesh. They're freed of the flesh. Their souls are pure, free of the flesh. Just like, for example, when Satan is bound a thousand years, all of a sudden everybody is okay in the world. Not one person is rebellious or any other way that is not befitting in the presence of the kingdom of God. So absent the flesh, people are free. Free from turmoil, free from these dark thoughts, free from foul language, free from doings of the flesh, driven by lusts of the flesh. They're free. When the Lord calls somebody home, that simply means they have finished their race. It is Christ who determines who's going to be with him and who's not. He has the keys of hell and death. Christ does. He determines who's going to the pit and who is not. And according to the word of God, I'll go against everything anybody ever said about those going to hell. Only Christ can determine that. A person cannot do that. Jesus died walking as a man, feeling the pain of death, ridicule, and everything else in this earth, that he may wash us from these deeds that we do and these things we can't escape from this web we've weaved ourselves. That's what Christ is for, lest we make him null and void, saying we don't need him, that somehow we made it ourselves. Well, we know that's not the truth. The intent of a person in servitude to Christ, and we all know when the heart of another person loves the Lord, they go after him. Yes, they're going to stumble and make mistakes, but the beautiful part of an individual is they keep coming back to Christ. The wicked do not do that. The wicked justify their hatred. The wicked begin to talk against love itself. The wicked begin to do all sorts of wicked things. But those with the seed of God in them, which is why they have a strong belief in Christ, we know that Christ will secure them. And when they're freed from the flesh, they are finished. They have accomplished what the Lord sent him here to do. And we don't know what that is for somebody else. We barely know what it is for us. But they're free in this season that we live in. Many more are going to fall, and there are a lot of Christians afraid of death. It's not real to them. It's not solidified to them. They don't believe it, and then when it happens, they're shaken up. They can't go a step further. And the truth is, it's because we never really believe it's going to happen to somebody close to us. But we forget that tomorrow is not promised to any of us. But that doesn't mean it's some disastrous thing either. If I were in pain for years of my life, and I were about to go home, I think I would be upset if somebody stopped me. And, oh, no, stay here. I'd say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Because the place all of us want to be, is it not to be with the Lord? Yes. So those who pass are, in fact, free when they believe in the Lord. And those of us who are left behind, we still have a work to do. But one issue I want to bring up, one issue. See, there's so much has happened in people's lives since 2010. Some have become quite loving, others bitter. But in both cases, sometimes we take each other for granted, don't we? 
we assume the person is going to be there the next day. I have a habit of telling people that there is no argument on earth that I will ever partake in that holds value to me over the simplicity of another person. In other words, I will appreciate that person today. I'm not going to miss the opportunity to appreciate a person. The same way in the Word of God, when Jesus said God is the God of the living, and lots of us have missed that point, which is to say, look around at your brothers and your sisters who are still here. Don't shun them away, because one day they will go. A truthful fact for all of us is all of us are going to have to go. And in this time that we occupy, do you not know that many will be gone? They'll be taken away. They're going to go. And then what? Do we fall down distraught? Or do we have understanding of the Lord's truth? These are topics people don't want to discuss. And all too often when somebody passes, nobody wants to discuss death. Or what death is. There is no death to a saint. There is only a transition. In that respect, those that we have lost in the flesh here in COT, they're not crying. They're not mourning. There are no tears. They're free. They made it. We are the ones that still have something to do. See, for a person who does not understand this and has really absorbed this, massive death in the days to come will shake them. And it's unpopular to talk about death, though it happens every single day. And people don't plan on death. You don't wake up one morning planning on the person next to you to go or your best friend going. We don't plan on these things. And in truth, the only way to really get used to it is for it to keep coming to you. Then you have no choice but to realize nobody has promised tomorrow. Because once you realize that, you're not interested in proving yourself right to anybody. So you stop arguments. You know why? What argument is worth it when another person is not promised the next few moments? And if they happen to go, you can't even apologize. There's nothing you can do. And if a person says, well, I wouldn't be bothered by that, then you're hard-hearted. Your heart is stone. So Jesus said, God is a God of the living. Let the dead bury the dead, he said. That's almost like saying, those who are alive in this world, there's something for you to do. When you are done, you can't do anything for anybody here. But when you're alive, you have an opportunity to do so much. Not for the sake of self, but for the sake of somebody else. So I have an exercise for you guys. Something I used to force myself to do, to realize the truth. Does it have an impact on your life? You better believe it. Today, I want you to see everybody, everybody you know, look at them. If you pass them by, talk to them or whatever, and understand that that person may only have hours left, that this could be the last day you ever speak to them. This can be the last day you can ever sow love into them, but they may not be there in the next moments. Now, I ask you something. Having said that, is there any problem on this earth worth a separation of you and that person. Think about that. See, in truth, if we face the truth, a lot of people will shun one another, arguments, breakups, and all this stuff, right? They get away from each other. Why? Because they take the other for granted, thinking that they're going to be here forever, that that concept of them leaving the flesh is not in their hearts and minds. Because if it is, and they still desire to do some sort of a dark work, which is outside of love, then guess what? They've got a hardened heart. But if you don't have a hardened heart, take inventory of who the Lord has placed in your life and realize you don't know them by accident. You will never meet a stranger. Everybody in your life is purposed in your life. Each of you have a purpose. The people you know, they have a purpose, but they're also precious. They may not get everything right. Their mouth may say some things you don't like, but the Lord has given you an ability to recognize when compassion and love is within a person. Satan does not have compassion and love. Satan has to fake it. And fake love, well, you can spot that a mile away. Fake love is selfish. It is. It's greedy. It wants everything for itself and everything its way. True love is full of sacrifice. It is giving. And when you take inventory today, realize God has sent those people here just like he sent you here. Also realize you're staring at yourself. You're looking right into yourself with a different type of cloak on or robe. Underneath, you're looking at yourself. Is it worth? Is any argument worth? If you knew a person was passing in five minutes, I guarantee you all, none of us would have an argument with somebody else. If the world fell upside down and somebody had five minutes to live, you would disregard the world for that person. 
my question is, why can't we do that when we're alive? Jesus gave us that ability, a continuous ability to do that. So in truth, we're choosing ourselves because in fact, we are taking everybody for granted as though they're gonna be alive a few more days, a few more years. Well, the truth is, none of us are promised tomorrow, nor the next moments. And Jesus does not have a habit of telling everybody when everybody is going to go. Appreciate those around you. Look into who they are, not what they're doing, not the flesh. You have an ability to see the intent of a person. Because if you call out anything by the flesh, you're going to be dissatisfied or full of lust one way or the other. But if you look beyond the flesh into your friend, into your relative, because in truth, they are your relatives. If you can realize this, the way you see everybody will change. You may not have the problems, the social problems you walk around with. You ever have a relative who is upset? You can't speak to that individual right away. You have to wait until they calm down. Well, some people take years, but understand that they could be gone. It could be your last time seeing them. Don't think that way for yourself, telling everybody else, hey, you better love me now because I may be gone one day. Don't adopt that attitude, please. But look at everybody else, knowing that they're not promised tomorrow, even when they don't know it. Take inventory of what the Lord has placed in your life. Everything is purposed for you. See, you're not this ordinary individual on the face of the earth. Because you believe in Christ, God has put something inside of you. That's why you believe in Christ. You cannot believe in Christ unless God has placed something inside of you. Jesus said, no man comes to me unless the Father has sent them to me. And if God has sent you to his Son, he did so with a purpose, didn't he? And in order for you to hear the voice of the Lord, you begin to seek Christ. You have to be able to hear spiritual things. You did hear it. Nobody goes to Christ lest the Father has given that person to Christ. So then the faith and the love of Christ was placed in you by God the Father. Well, God loves his only begotten Son. So then a portion of God's love is put inside of you and it draws you to the Messiah, which is why you find him precious, don't you? It's hard for us to understand it, but you find him precious. That's the beginning. Now, any time to adopt all of his words, I can't help but to go back to arguments, bickering and fighting. Is it really worth it? To me, it's not. Not any day of my life is it worth it. It is not worth me operating outside of love itself. It's so funny, too. Humanity doesn't really know the definition of God's love. They have the fantasy version, not the true version. Because God equals love. Did somebody erase that from the Word of God? That God equals love? God is love. So... What happens when you do something outside of love? God is not in it. It's that simple. Then in fact, all of what we do, we do in love. Because God equals love. Do you know that love is discipline? See, when you care about somebody, when you really do care, just so you get this right, when you really do care about someone, it does not mean you're going to be all nice and lovey-dovey. See, can I just talk to you normally here for a second? When you really love someone, you care about where they're going to end up. And when you care about where somebody is going to end up, you're not going to do anything that will cause that person to stumble, that will cause that person to jeopardize their own safety or any other thing. What you will do is you will have patience. You'll hear beyond their cries. You will purposely pray that they be secured and you will not interrupt God's processes in that person's life. You won't turn away, but you may sit still. It's just like a child. When you love a child, you don't agree with what a child is saying all the time, do you? No, because if you did, you would kill that child. Children say strange things, and they have weird ideas. If you agreed with everything a child said, you would be responsible for that child's death as a parent because you do love them. You will tell that child straight to their face. No. When they cry with tears, oh, can I have so-and-so? No, you may not. Oh, can I just go outside with no coat? No. Oh, can I go play? I know I didn't do my homework for five days. No. Why are you saying these things? Why would you say no to a child like that? Because you know that without discipline, that if you reward wickedness, the child is going to self-destruct when they grow up. You're training them in the way they should go. So then discipline 
is love. A lot of people will say, well, I know God loves me. And I always ask people person to person. I don't do this on air, but I'll say, how do you know God loves you? I will challenge them. How do you know? Did he rescue you from anything recently? Weren't you in trouble last night? You still have that trouble today? How do you know he loves you? The truth is, you can't prove it. You just know it. You can't prove that. You just know that. But how do you know it? Because his love is placed in you. And there's a witness to his love within you. It's built into your spirit. That born-again spirit is a witness of all things that are of the Father. You know it, but you cannot prove it. That's like um, I've had people in my life that find me very difficult because I'm full of discipline, right? I'm very nice on air. Person to person, it's all about business. There's no monkey business, no playing, no little side game here and there. So I'm very different person to person because I care about people. I care about a person making it. In my heart, I want every living soul to make it. I know that won't happen, but it will not stop me from being there. But I can be a little too uh, straightforward. I don't beat around the bush. On air, I'm dealing with an audience. And so you have to speak to the audience in a way that the audience understands. One-on-one, -on -one, it's very different. Why, though? How can a person be so hard, so tough, person to person? But that is love, isn't it? That is love. Love is when you want a person to make it. As a Christian, when you want a person to make it, you know you can't do it by your own wisdom. No, you can't do it by your own intellect of what you think. I can't do it by what I think. I know what they need. They need the words of Jesus Christ, don't they? That's what they need. They need Christ. They need to find him. He is their answer. So then guess what? A lot of people will come to me crying with issues and problems. You know who I point them to? Christ. See, I know this, that if you can have your answer, which is the Lord, you're always going to have your answer. If I give you an answer, even if I know it, you're going to keep coming back to me. And I already know you're going to be dependent upon me to give you the answer. That's person-to-person -person behavior. But when you're pointed to Christ, when you're encouraged to go straight to Christ, that's an answer. That's the solution. That's freedom. That's liberty. Because there's so many folks who think they have it together. And I'm telling you now, and Jesus told us too, they're not going to make it. Sometimes we overlook things Jesus said. And it's all about character. For example, you ever met a person that says they just have this persona like, I know I'm right. They're right no matter what. Correct? They're going to be right in the end. That same character these folks got before Christ. You know what he said to them in the end? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. But why? Because they thought they had it right. And when you think you have everything right, you're unteachable. You won't even take anything in. And you become too judgmental. In fact, being judgmental is when you think you have it right. But when you think you have things wrong, the last thing you'll do is judge somebody else. Only when you think you have mastered something. Well, you begin to criticize everybody else. Some of you folks in academia, you know this. Some of you folks that have been in real leadership positions, you know this. You also know there's a penalty. And when I say real leadership positions, I mean that somebody else's life and their death was in your hands on a daily basis. There is no greater burden upon your shoulders than to be in control of somebody's life and their death and they were right in the palm of your hands. Which means if you make a wrong call, hundreds of men are going to die. Thousands of men could die. That burden causes you to realize there is no solution, lest it be Christ Jesus, who is an eternal solution. Because in the end, man will be a liar. All mankind will be a liar, and God will be true. All of mankind will be a liar. That means no one spoke an absolute truth here on this earth. How do I know that? Because it's in the Word of God, every single last person. See, if it were not for Christ, we could forget it. If I saw perfection in someone, and I had the highest standards in the world, it would be but a huge fallacy unto the Lord. There is no way we can gauge His perfection, because He did not make us to perceive. We can't even see the fullness of the spiritual realm. How in the world can we have a whole truth? But we can have Christ. 
man makes things up. They always make things up about the spiritual realm, right? Theories, all these things. As though somebody went around with a clipboard, first of all, to record all the demons' names. Demons are liars, aren't they? Somebody show me a clipboard with all the demons' names. See, I can't subscribe to those things because it's unseen. And Jesus and the apostles warned us about men speaking about those things they know nothing about. It was almost a statement where they would make up things, having the entire populace to believe it. But they're being set up for something so deceitful. And the penalty has come. I've noticed people being taken over every single day by this hate and this immoral way of being is spreading all throughout the earth. There is beguilement happening. All this stuff that is not of the throne of God is iniquity. And it's very difficult for the common person to see iniquity. And because it is so difficult, then that makes our solution in Christ even the more greater. Man is now gullible again. They're believing too much. Stuff is being made up every single day. And they follow it like it's the way to go. Listen, man's ways are not God's ways. And Jesus gave us a simple way. Not this complicated way fashioned after orders and instructions and rule books. Huh? That's man's way of controlling someone. Let me ask you this. I'm going to put you to the test about control. I'm going to show you something about this control spirit. Many of you out there right now, you will go out of your mind. If you don't have a handle and you don't know where every single bill is, all the phone numbers must be in one area. All this has to be in that area. All this, and then you feel good. It does not necessarily mean you memorized all the phone numbers. No, but you want control over your environment. And you make everything your way or you cannot rest. Now follow me. This same behavior also goes with one's faith. Until you hit that point where you're shaken up so much that everything is out of order. And then and only then will you learn one of the biggest lessons in your life about faith. About man's order and God's order. About following Christ and not following something we deem as being Christ. When everything is upside down and shaken up and things are all over the place. Your mind is going in a thousand different directions and you've lost absolute control. That's when you really face it. You won't face it any other time in your life. You won't even see it. You may not know what I'm speaking of until your world turns upside down. And then when it flips, you begin to realize something. You say, oh boy, wait a minute. Now, you know, I thought I was a little further along, but boy, did I deceive myself a little bit here. That's what you do. You realize, wait, why I don't, I don't have it together. That's what you realize. You realize you're standing in the middle of chaos and you deceived yourself thinking that somehow everything was in order. But then something beautiful begins to happen. Because when the world won't turn right side up, you say, okay, it's not my way. It's not my will. It's not my plan. Lord, I do surrender. See, when everything is shaken up so bad that you cannot get control, when you surrender then, you have truly surrendered. And it's not phony and fake. See, sometimes we surrender because we have everything we want. We surrender. The doorbell rings. We rush up. Somebody comes in. So, ooh, don't sit there. Let me go get this glass. Let me sit you right here. Let me go do this, that, and the other. But when all of it's gone, when it's ripped away, and it's just you left, just you, just the bare bones basics, that's when you realize. You say, oh, my Lord, I was partially identified by my stuff. I was partially identified by what I created for myself. I was living in my own fantasy. Then the truth sets in. The truth is, the identity we form for ourselves is what God does not know. That stripped off person that you are with nothing is who your father knows. Because the more stuff you have, you're changing what you're wearing. It's like a person that goes into their closet and they put on all their clothing. But every store they go into, they take off some clothing. Nobody's going to know who they are because they keep changing. But when it's all stripped away, that's who the Father sent here. He did not send here the person we made for ourselves, identifying ourselves with all the stuff, with the language, with the education, with all this, that, and the other. And honestly, when it's all stripped away, so is the majority of a person's identification of who they were. And it really begins to get to you. And you know how thick it was, how strong it was, because you begin to hurt. I've gone through a stripping in life. The first time was not voluntary. The other times were voluntary. Times where I just gave away everything I owned. 
And to this day, I will not let any materialistic thing define me. No position will define me. None of man's titles will define me. Nothing will define me. No amount of money or no least amount of money will define me. I'm defined solely by faith. When your world is upside down, you become who you're supposed to be. You also find a new motive, a brand new purpose in life. You also see how distracted you were and how tough it is to escape. Somebody knows what I'm talking about because it is almost impossible to escape the identity we have made for ourselves unless it is stripped away from you. In other words, it becomes a blindness, a blindness that you can only recognize when everything is gone. Well, guess what? You see, a season has come. And we've talked about this in COT before. But it won't sink in until you go through it. And then you'll realize it. Then it becomes clear. Then you can see. Then the foolishness falls away. Oh, how many things were foolish in me when everything was taken away from me. I learned so much about myself that I hate my flesh to this very day. I found out that there are no external deceivers. There's only one internal deceiver. And while I was looking out at everything else, the truth is, all I was doing was defending what I had built unto myself. So anything that came against what I had built unto myself, I called the devil. Isn't that funny? But here's a good part. When you're doing your work for somebody else, you don't care what comes against it because it's not yours. And if it be for an important person, then whoever tries to steal it has to answer to the important person. In our case, if somebody tries to steal something from me, matters of my father or of my Lord, they don't have to answer to me. That's none of my business. That's their problem. If they continue to do that, they're going to have to give answer to that. That's their problem. It's not my problem. See, I'm not in the habit of defending anything these days. I've asked you guys a lot of times, don't go out there on the net, defend me. Don't do that. You have no need to do that. Because if you do that, that's a type of vengeance. No, the Lord may do who you are, but he sent you here. Who you are, we are the ones that put turtle shells on our backs. We try to become turtles, don't we? We make a shell and live in that shell. And if anything tries to touch that shell, we snap at them, don't we? If anything tries to scratch the shell, we snap. Oh, the Lord, you made snapping turtles. That's very befitting of what we have done for ourselves. We sit inside of a shell, and anything that comes against the shell, we begin to bite at, snap at. It is funny in nature that some of the most well-protected species on Earth are also the most vicious. That's hilarious. But the exposed species are the most passive, like deer. So the aggressors are armed, and the cattle, whatever the prey is, is not armed funny thing in it funny thing you know what's even funnier predators like lions and tigers they don't taste too good dogs they don't taste good they don't taste good at all it tastes like filthy meat they're made up of filth it tastes like filthy meat but thing you have the cattle and they have a type of pure meat predators devour things right cattle graves devouring species are filthy inside when they devour aren't they they're, they're filthy anyway the season that we're in requires soberness. It requires the truth. In the Bible, there are truths in the Bible that we look over quite a bit because it involves death. Many people, when they read the Word of God, they only want to hear what's going to be good for them, what's going to add to their shell, to their life, to their cloak. Once all that's gone, hear me. Once everything is stripped away from you, that's when your moment of true surrender comes. Because if you surrender during that time when you have nothing, then the Lord can add unto you. If you have what you want in life, it's very difficult for you to see, for you to understand. There are lots of folks right now on the West Coast going back through their ashes. People on the East Coast are about to join them. Why would they do that? Because their heart, because their memories, their heart is tied to the special things they had in their homes. And the Word teaches us where a man's treasure is, there his heart is also. Heart and the treasure go in the same place. But it's also quite revealing of us. Humanity as a whole has identified themselves with wealth. You take all that away, who are they? Who are you? Who are you with nothing? Because that's who you really are. 
That's just like sickness. You think you know a person who's in good health? You think that's who the person is? No, it isn't. When a person is in bad health and they can't take it anymore, that's when you meet the real person. When a person is in good health, their ability to suppress things is great. When a person has everything they want, they suppress who they really are. When their life is stripped away and when they're in sickness, you're going to find out who they really are. This revealing is going to be how it is. It will prevail. God has already set this up. He spoke about it, but the problem was we were seeing it from a perspective that we made up ourselves. Now we get to see the truth of it. That's why in the Bible it says, only a fool asks for the day of the Lord, for what good is in it for you? And it was likened to a person escaping a bunch of stuff outside that go into their own house, put their hand on their door saying, oh, I'm home, and then a snake bites them. There's no good thing in the day of the Lord. These are the times we're facing. But I'll ask this. If it takes a situation like that to open up the eyes of the children of the living God, then guess what? If that's what it takes, that's what's going to happen. A stripping of things from our lives. See, the Lord is good and he does not want us to perish. So then anything that hinders us from salvation is going to be removed. Anything in your life that hinders you from having the truth is going to be removed. And so long as you don't denounce Christ, he will continue to raise you. He will remove it. Do you think people are ready for that? Because many of them will say, God no longer loves me. He took my whole family. He took everything from me. They're going to blame God. Did you notice in Revelation that men became haters of God openly? They blamed everything on God. Why did they do that? How would they even know him to blame him? Because they once walked as Christians. That's how. You don't know God that well unless you've been on the inside. And they were on the inside. Hence, the falling away. They were on the inside. And they took the way of Cain, who slew his brother for the word of God. Cain murdered his brother for the word of God. The way of Cain is to murder your brother for the word of God. And that's just one of a hundred different things that is taking place. People are murdering each other, saying that they're doing God a service. The scriptures are coming to pass. They will kill you, destroy you, saying, I'm doing this for God, is what they'll say. No, because God equals love. Never forget that. You forget that, Satan will have you. God is love. You forget that, Satan will have you. And they're doing it right now. And I will not enter into any such thing. I will not rip anybody's name. No, no, that's for the heathen and the condemned. Because those same individuals, it was already foretold, will stand before the Lord saying, didn't I preach in your name? Yes. Didn't I heal in your name? Yes. Didn't I do this in your name? Yes. Didn't I do that in your name? Yes. And Jesus will tell them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. There is no God outside of love. God is love. And if all things are done within the Father or with the Father, then all things are done in love, and nothing should be done outside of love. All of our doings should be of the Lord and pleasing to the Lord, which is by faith. All of our doings should be by faith and for the Lord. Sarah says, Michael, should you tell them before they die and hear that from Jesus? Should you tell them what, that they're wrong? Let me explain this. And I had to explain this before, but I'll explain this as often as I can because it is, I'm going to explain something that is so simple, but it is fought tooth and nail. So let me explain this. There comes a point in time, and I need you to remember your own salvation and how many people you did not listen to. How many people came to you, but you didn't listen? Some of you, nobody came to you, but yet you still received, you still received the message. So let me explain this to you. See, God does something for each and every person on this earth. So let me share it with you. The true choice of a person is not dependent upon us because the Lord will set a time in a person's life where he presents himself in truth. In other words, he will open up their eyes that they may receive the truth of him, that they may make a choice. When they make that choice, they have made a true choice. 
See, it was never our presentation, right? We can choose to assist in what Jesus is already doing. And that could be our work here on the earth, but it's not contingent upon us. There's a time in a person's life when they are presented that absolute moment where they see the truth. You have to see your own salvation because in that moment, and nobody explained, truth opened up to you and you made a choice. See, everybody has this opportunity. Our Father is not a trickster. He would not hinge our salvation to another who may not want to be obedient, right? Or who may miss saying something. He does not hinge our salvation on the lips of anybody. He presents it himself at an appointed time. Now, we may choose to assist, but I'm telling you now, he appoints a time and he does it himself. See, a lot of people have this God complex where they believe, well, if I don't tell them, they won't know and they'll go to hell. No, they won't. Because Jesus has the keys of hell and death. We don't. No. If we don't tell them, so what? Jesus will introduce himself to them. He will open up their hearts and minds to make a choice. And it's all about that choice. It's all about it. The Lord will do that. He'll do that. He'll do. He really will. But now, I'm glad you bring that up because there are some folks out there that are murdering other folks because they will get out there and say, well, I've got to tell them or they're going to die. See, they're lying to themselves. But I found that they're taking a joy in the murder of another. They would rather beat somebody up with the word than to trust in the Lord's process. And most of it is because they never waited to see the Lord's process. They never took note of it. They never found it in Scripture. There's so many things you can find in Scripture. It is a, it is the Bible. It seems like that, that one, even the King James Version of the Bible, could fill up an entire room, compact it in those few pages is some amazing things. It really is. There's no point in time. See, the truth is God does not need us. He loves us. But some people get a God complex in the earth and they get lifted up within themselves and they begin to murder other folks and say they're doing it for God. These are the same individuals that will stand before the Lord and he will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Why? Because they murdered other folks. They used God's word to murder, and they justify it by the words of Christ. Hypocrites they are, and they will go where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, the Lord warned us, didn't he? He said they will kill you and think that they doeth God a service. He said they will turn you over. He said so many things about those folks, how they would do it in the name of God, saying that thus saith the Lord. And then what was read right after that? That God did not speak to them. They were speaking to make their granaries fat. In other words, they did what they did to get something in return. See, if they didn't receive anything, they wouldn't do it. I'm telling you that now, and we're going to see that. Because what would happen if no Christian organization could receive funds from anybody? Who would preach then? Many people would have an excuse, wouldn't they? Some people would stop and wouldn't devote themselves to it because it wouldn't be lucrative. You know what the Lord had suggested to me a long time ago? See, because it's so funny, because with COT, donations and all that stuff, it was, when it started, there's no, none of that stuff. We don't run from other folks' money. No, that runs from my wallet. Whom he called, he also qualified. That runs from my wallet, right? Mine, the ring of fire, and it's in likewise, and all these other ministries out there, they're going to run from that individual love whom God called. But see, I saw this. I, I, the Lord showed me so clearly. That without, I'm telling you now, without the resources, even in the book of Ezekiel, even with Isaiah, even with Jeremiah, without the money coming back, they'll say, no, this isn't profitable. I can't do it. Lord, I'd like to do the Lord's work, but uh, I have to go to work. No, they don't understand. When the Lord calls you, it is you. When somebody starts an organization, you can't separate the organization from the person. The person is the organization. You can't separate that. If the Lord called you and put a word in you, that word is going to come out, and it's not contingent. See, Satan will try to stop and discourage people by way of money. But if the Lord called you to do something, you can do it with or without the money. If it's in your heart to do it, you're going to burn with it anyway, and you're going to do it regardless. When I wasn't on COT for the last two weeks, I was all over the place. It was so funny because I don't slow down. I will not slow down. And it was purpose. So you guys may not have received it on one end, but believe me, it was all over the place. Why? I'm not going to stop if the internet goes down. The 
internet has nothing to do with what the Lord put in me. Right now, for the moment, while the internet is up and we can utilize communications, we'll utilize this avenue. What the Lord put in you is not contingent upon your car, your income, your house, your anything. He put it inside of you. It goes where you go. You are that calling. And you're going to reach people. Why would God put a calling in a person that couldn't do anything? Wrong? No. See, we forget about this one thing, too. He said, if you lift up his name, he'll call all men unto you. That means you don't have to go to anybody. They're going to come and find you. You just make sure you're ready to receive them with the truth and not manipulation, not some story, not some theological process you've thought up in your mind. These prophecies, one of the big ones is that men will begin to work outside of love, outside of God. God is love. You know what? You don't hear that scripture a lot, do you? God is love. You don't hear that. You know why? Because people have to compensate for their own hate inside. They can't use that. They can't talk about forgiveness. They can't talk about subjects that they're unwilling to do themselves. I'm, I'm just telling you the truth. They won't do. You won't hear it. You're not going to hear people come up there saying, forgive everybody, because they would turn right around and start talking against somebody. Saints don't talk against other people. Saints of the living God should have the same heart of the Father that he has. You know what the Father's heart is? He did not condemn anybody, but rather he sent his Son that they could be saved. And if that heart be in us, then we are his children. How can a child of the living God not want another person to be redeemed? And God is no respecter of persons. How can we be a respecter of persons? See, there's too much hypocrisy in us, isn't it? And a lot of people do not want the same thing God wants, so they're not working for him. They're working for themselves. And those are the ones in which Christ will come, and they will really think they have made it. And he will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And listen, if he never knew them, they were never his. If they were preaching, they were casting out devils, they were doing things in the name of Jesus, and he never, ever knew them. And if he didn't know them, they did not come from God. So how do you know who these folks are? No, the, the more important question is, how do you make sure you're not one of those people? Don't worry about checking everybody else's passport. Don't do that. You're not the kingdom police. You don't check ID cards wanting to know who is who. You don't have to do that. It's very simple. Here's the question. Do you love your enemy as you love yourself? Somebody may say, oh, yes, I love my enemy. Another person may say, but that's not what the word says. It says, love your neighbor as yourself, but love your enemy is their difference. When you read it in context, you realize that Jesus said to love everybody outside of you, just like you love your own soul. How do you do that? You wouldn't cast yourself away. In fact, when you're cast away, you get upset, you get hurt, you get lonely. So then love somebody else. Love your enemy like that. In other words, never cast them away. Never put them in a position of rejection or anything else. You see how that works? Because we don't like to be cast away. So why would we cast somebody else away? We don't want our names cast out for evil. So why would we cast somebody else's name out for evil? Now do you see the hypocrisy? You see how simple that is? We don't want these things upon ourselves, yet we would inflict them upon another and then justify it by Scripture. That is not of the Lord. That is of Satan. That same thing entered into Cain, which is why he killed his brother. He killed his brother in the name of God. He killed his brother over a sacrifice. Do you understand that? Abel was competition for Cain, and he killed him to get rid of the competition, thinking he did a good thing. After he killed him for an invalid reason, which was murder, what did God do to Cain? You know what he told Cain? He said, Cain, you must master sin but I'm going to separate you. I'm going to mark you in your forehead. He said, oh God, they'll surely kill me. If they see this, they're going to... No, nobody's going to kill you because I will require a sevenfold upon whoever thinks that thought. Do you see that? God is not some cruel individual out there like these folks present. They don't understand that they can't comprehend it because I'll say it again. Until they're stripped of everything, they're likely deceiving themselves. Your world has to be turned upside down. In order for you to see, you have to lose your world. You're going to have to lose some things to find yourself. And no one wants to go through that. And it's coming anyway. Because your Father in Heaven wants you completely delivered. And we will be broken by mighty hand. So that we can be accounted among His children forever. The Lord does not play games. No. Even that is going to cause a person to say, nope, I don't want it. 
This is too much. I don't want it. But don't you worry about it. It's for you, not against you. And you can never lose anything that truly belongs to you. You will lose nothing in the process. But everything that's been in your way will eventually be stripped away. And if you love the Lord, there's no way you're going to hold on to anything. Once you have handed that over to Him, because you prayed for it, Lord, I surrender, I give up everything not of you. I don't want anything that's not you in my life. Didn't you say that? You said that. I don't want anything that's not you. So guess what? Your process began when you truly meant that. And you began to lose things in your life that you thought was yours. It wasn't yours. You can't lose what really belongs to you. That's almost like losing your skin color. If it belongs to you, it cannot be lost. But everything that does not belong to you, you're not going to take with you. Your Father in heaven is delivering you by way of Jesus Christ. He sent you here by yourself. He will deliver you by yourself. And you will join your brothers and your sisters. There are many things in your way that you cannot see. These things that are happening in the earth and that will massively escalate only serve to take away from all of us what does not belong to us, what is in the way, what is very divisive in our lives. This identity we have put onto ourselves must be burnt away. We are in the crucible. It must be taken away because we have a good father who is very serious about our deliverance. If we can cry and have a broken heart over the deliverance of another, then you know our Father is serious about our deliverance, and He's not playing games, nor will He play games with Satan. Don't you ever think Satan can waltz around doing what he wants to do? He is not the focus of our lives. Our Father is. He is purging us and cleaning us from all things. We don't know what makes us blind until he gives us sight to see it. We have a good father. But these things will come. They will escalate. Many of your brothers and your sisters are not promised the next few moments. They're not promised tomorrow. Love them today as best you can. Love them today. There is no argument worth it. Nothing worth parting company. This is silly stuff. Love them today. Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.